So let's look at this example. Say we wanted to find volume when the region bounded by y equal to sine of x squared and y equal to zero is revolved around the y-axis. I might should be a little more specific, I suppose. Technically, if you didn't specify, this region would go on forever because y equals sine of x squared just kind of looks like this. Right, it's kind of like kind of sinus looking, but a little more kind of like this. And then it would keep going, just doing the same thing over and over and over again. We just want the first part of that. So let's say this, some people might say, and between like x equals zero and x equals root pi, kind of an annoying way to describe it. We just might say on the interval from zero to root pi. That feels more normalish to me. So we're revolving this region around the y-axis. So we're going to draw, or we don't have to, we'll draw the other little part over here. And now, what kind of strip do we want to use? Do we want to use a vertical strip, or do we want to use a horizontal strip? I would say vertical, for a couple reasons. Reason one, all, things, all other things being equal, the function is defined in terms of x. So if you have no other reason to make a choice one way or the other, pick the strip that goes with the way the function is already defined. If you have y as a function of x, a vertical strip with a dx makes sense. If you have x as a function of y, a horizontal strip with a dy makes sense. Here, a horizontal strip is also terrible because if you use a horizontal strip, well, first of all, if I used a horizontal strip, what kind of method would I be using? Shell or disk or washer? Right, I'm using washer and my inner function, my inner radius would be sine of x squared, but I have to change it. And my outer radius would be sine of x squared and I have to change it. That'd be terrible, right? I'd have to do this. I'd have to be like, ugh. So I'd have y equal to sine of x squared. And then I'd have to say arc sine of y equals x squared and x is Ugh, plus or minus doesn't really work. You have to do this whole kind. Of, it's really funky. You'd have to do a lot of work to make it work this way. You have to like define your domain and stuff. And it's just, it's more work. That, if you see it going one way, it's looking like it's going to be terrible. It's probably a good indication that we should be doing it the other way. So doing it this way means we're going to have to use the shell method because the strip we chose was parallel to our axis of rotation. So now I'm going to draw, we don't have to draw the little shell, but we can. And so I would say to your question earlier, Manny, this is dx. It's a small change in x. And the width of this rectangle is a small change in x. And it's just at the very, very top of it, the height on the left and the right side is a little bit of difference. But that difference is so negligible when we're talking about the area of this rectangle that we ignore it. The thickness is dx. But that's the width of this rectangle. Well, right. Well, cause, well, because really, so when I think about shell, I'm thinking about the volume of my shell being two pi r. That's my length, right? The circumference of my circle that I unravel. And then times the height of my function, my height, times the dx. That's my thickness. Um, and then we actually plug in the thing. So here, our radius is, what is our radius? Just x, just the distance from the axis of rotation. Question? Could you draw that one on shell? Yeah. Shells out. Sure. So the shell. And the indicate what would be the base, how would you, because I don't have a hard time visualizing it.
So here is that rectangle that's right here. And so this here is your dx. This here is your height, which is just your function. And here is your radius, which is just x. Is it always just x, no matter the function? Mm, no. So the, the radius depends on two things. I mean, really, so really, generally, very generally, the radius is the distance to the axis of rotation. So if your axis of rotation is just the y-axis, a.k.a. x equals zero, then it's x minus zero, which is x. x minus minus two. Or if we were going around the x-axis, your radius would be y because of how far you are away from the axis of rotation, which is y equals zero. And we'll see an example of that, I think, in the next one. Yeah. Mm hmm It'd be one minus x. Always the difference, the okay. distance, the difference, the distance, the difference between the two things. Oh, right. One would be a problem because one would intersect this region. We need something a little bigger than one. But yeah, like, yeah. Um, so to, to finish off here, we have 2 pi x times sine of x squared times dx. And then to find the actual volume, we would do the integral of 2 pi x times sine of x squared dx from 0 to root pi. And then we could actually do this integral via u substitution. We would let u equal x squared, or du would equal 2x dx. And I see I have a 2x dx. So all that's going to be my du. And so then this integral becomes, and running out of room here, that pi is still there, so I'm gonna put the pi out in front. And my two x dx is my du, and my sine of x squared is my sine of u. And I'm a big proponent of changing the limits of integration. So I'm going to say, oh, well, x is zero, then u is zero squared, which is zero. And if x is root pi, then u is gonna be root pi squared, which is just pi which works out to be pretty nice limits of integration for sine of u. So then we anti-differentiate. We get pi times negative cosine of u from zero to pi. We get pi times negative cosine of pi minus negative cosine of zero, which ends up being pi times negative negative one plus one which is two pi. There's a question. Oh, so the question, how's the line of stuff equal two pi? I'm so sorry, we, I, was, I just wasn't done writing it. Yeah, yeah, I see it. Yeah. Right, because, yeah, it's not, it's, it's, it's something that doesn't end up mattering because Right, just like, just like when we were finding area under a curve, right? We added up all the rectangles and we let the widths get really, really small. And the height of that rectangle as the width gets super duper small. I know I'm making the argument that you're gonna make against me in a minute here to say, well, why is it work for this other thing? Um, so just hold on, hold on to your hat. That right, that that width from the left to the right becomes the width becomes so infinitesimally small that the height difference between the two sides is negligible, right? It's virtually the same with the rectangle. So Hold that question that I know you want to ask until until we've talked about arc light. Okay. Um, and then, uh, so James, isn't James, I have a question. Text? Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, like like I was saying in the chat, isn't u equal to x squared? So it would be pi squared when you're actually doing the fundamental theorem. So when you, pi squared, I'm not sure what you mean precise, like which, where, so u is definitely equal to x squared. 
and then I was doing a U substitution, right? Right. When you plug um, x squared back into cosine and you're like. I never plugged x squared back into cosine. So that's oh, the thing. Oh, oh, I see. Because you're but, doing the FTC on U, not right, exactly. on x. These here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So if you do a U substitution, you can either go back to your original limits of integration, x equals zero to x equals root pi, or you can stick with your new limits of integration, u equal to zero and u equal to pi. And if you stick with your new ones, you just get to plug those in at the end and not have to go back, which is my preferred way of doing it. Yeah, fair, fair point, good to look out. Thank you. Let's look at one more example of this, at least. Let's say we want to find, yeah. So the region, come on paper, get your act together. The region in quadrant one bounded by y equal to x squared, y equal to 16, and y equal to 8x revolved around the x axis. And we'll actually we'll 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 do we'll set up both of these here. We'll do revolved around. First, the x-axis, and then we'll try a different axis to see how it's going to change the radius. So let's draw the, I, I really can't just enough. For these problems where you're finding area, you probably don't necessarily have to draw the region, but it's still helpful. But if you're finding a volume of revolution or later on arc length or surface area, it's usually, you don't have to draw like the revolved shape, but it's really, really, really helpful to draw the region that you are going to be revolving, even if it's surface area or, or or arc length, oh, arc length, arc length, okay, yeah, surface area. Thinking of surface area, not arc length. So, um, yeah, let's draw this region. We know what these things look like. Y equals x squared, usual parabola. Y equals 16, horizontal line. Y equals 8x, straight line through the origin, going up from left to right. So I'm pretty confident that when I start drawing this, I know it's gonna look something like, well, here's my parabola. Here's my line, Y equals 16. And my straight line, and I might wanna check out I would I'd be willing to bet my straight line is going to do, look like this, where it's going to intersect the horizontal line instead of intersecting the parabola first. So, hmm, and I should put interesting. Yeah. Huh. Huh. Yeah. So I'm going to all say something about this in a second. But if I find if I think about where these intersect, x squared equal to 16, those intersect when x is equal to plus or minus four technically, but we're in the first quadrant. So that point there is four comma sixteen. And this intersecting, the straight line here is going to intersect when x equals 2. So somewhere over here. And then these two functions, x squared and 8x, if you set those equal to each other, they clearly intersect at 0 and also at x equals 8. which would be up here, further to the right. Now, you might notice that the way this question is phrased is unfortunately ambiguous. This says find the region, the quadrant one bounded by y equals x squared, y equals 16, y equals 8x, revolved around the x-axis. Well, that could actually be this region, or it could be that region. So the person writing this question, me, needs to be more clear. So I could say bounded below by x squared above by y equals 16 and also by y equals 8x. That clarifies what region I'm looking for. But you should be careful, right? Or really, your teacher should be careful. What I said. People, I've definitely seen a question written like this before in person, not be clear. So just make sure you're reading things carefully when you have questions like this. So we're looking at this region here. And if we're going around the x axis, while we certainly could use a vertical strip, that's going to be more work, meaning we're going to have to use two intervals if we use a vertical strip, because a vertical strip, if I draw one here, right, the outer radius is 8x and the inner radius is x squared. If I draw one here, the outer radius for my washer method is 16 and the inner radius for my washer method is x squared. So if I do washer, 
it would have to consist of two integrals. I'm not saying I'm against two integrals. I just don't want to do that right now. So instead, we're going to use the Shaw method, meaning we're going to have decided to have picked a horizontal strip, or more specifically, a strip parallel to our axis of rotation. All right, so usual deal, the volume of my shell is 2 pi r times h times d, in this case, dy. The radius of my shell is just how far away the shell is from the axis of rotation. So when you're thinking about drawing this strip that's parallel to your axis of rotation, you should think about the strip being at a, well, if it's horizontal, it's at a height of y. And if it's a vertical strip, it's at a, it's at a horizontal distance of x from the axis of rotation. Or I should say from the y-axis or from the x-axis. So now the volume of our shell is 2 pi times the radius, which is y times the height or length of that shell, which is going to be the right function minus the left function. Which is going to be 2 pi times y times, we need to write our functions as functions of y. So y equals x squared becomes x equal to the positive square root of y. And y equal to 8x becomes x equal to 1 eighth y. And then our total volume is going to be the integral from y equals 0 to y equals 16 of all this. 2 pi times y times the square root of y minus 1 eighth y which isn't too terrible to integrate. We'd multiply through, we'd have two pi times the integral from zero to 16 of y to the three halves minus one eighth y squared. I mean, it's not like it's beautiful, but it's not too terrible. And then we get two pi times y to the five halves times two fifths minus y to the third over 24 from zero to 16, and then you plug in 16 and you get two fifths times 16 to the five halves minus 16 cubed over 24. I mean, yeah, it's gross, but whatever. That's, that's an answer. You could simplify this more. I don't think we really need to, but you could. You should, I should not. I mean, I could, but I'm not going. Um, let's let's look at the difference just to kind of see. Let's go. Let's look back at this picture for just one second. Let's say instead we wanted to do the same thing, but now we want to go around the line y equal to twenty. So same region. I'm just going to kind of draw. Oops, that's. Oh. Uh, not my best work. A straight line. Oh my God. Really killing it and not the good way. Okay, here's my not good looking region. Sorry. Y equals x squared, y equals 8x, y equals 16. And now we're rotating around the line y equals 20. So we're still using the same horizontal strip. It's still located at a height of y. But now our, if I was gonna actually draw my, um, my shell, my shell would look like this. There's my shell. And 
the radius of my shell is right here. So the volume of this shell, just like the previous shell, is 2 pi times the radius times the height times the thickness. The only thing that's changed in this case is the radius. Right before the radius was just y. Now my radius is 20 minus y. The difference between the axis of rotation and where the strip lives. And if my line were y equal to negative 2, my radius would be y minus minus 2. Because it's always the bigger thing minus the smaller thing. So make sure the radius turns out to be positive. And then we still have the same height, square root of y minus 1 eighth y, and the same dy. We still have also the same limit of integration. So if I was trying to find the volume in total of this shape rotated around, which would look kind of funky, kind of like the tail of an arrow. No, not sorry, not the tail of an arrow, kind of, but not really. Um, we would integrate from y equals zero to y equals 16 of this whole thing here. Two pi times 20 minus y times the square root of y minus one eighth y. Which I'm not going to do. It's fairly similar to the other one, just a little bit more work. Question. I mean, if this shape was a shape of rotational, set, like if it was a shape that was generated by ro rotating a region like this around the volume, yeah. This can actually be used for like physics. Can you use that? Sure. Yeah. Totally. I mean, the, the assumptions that are being made, though, are that these shapes, you know, are perfect, right? Like, this is a shape that is exactly the shape, and there's no deformities, you're not missing anything, right? So, what shapes do we have that are from rotation generated from some rotation? I mean, lots of shapes spheres, cylinders, cones, anything you want to make, take any region in the two dimensional plane and rotate it around an axis, and there's a shape. Right, that water bottle, you could probably, you know, draw, like cut out like a thing of it and rotate it around. Um, this thing here, sure, this is a volume of revolution, right? This thing here, here's a volume of revolution. Can you guys see that? It's a little screw. Uh, not really, because the screws, the threads are not really symmetrical perfectly, right? Because they kind of, oh, so this probably would not work because it's not technically a volume of revolution. But I mean, the, the, asking the point though is, well, it's where I always kind of fail to be super helpful because in my opinion, the point is we do the math for fun because it's fun, but I know that's not always the case, so yeah. All right, let's talk about arc length. And we'll hopefully we'll see if we can get to surface area here. So let's let's read some words here. Imagine a particle moving along a curve. The arc length it travels we'll call S. So we've got some curve. And the particle is traveling along it. Goes here to there to there. Moving in this direction. Not that the direction really matters, but hey, whatever. And so let's say the arc length that travels, the arc length this particle travels is S. So it's velocity. Well, velocity is just the rate of change of position. Oh, let me just bring here, sorry. So its velocity is ds dt. The rate of change of how far it's traveled over how much time has elapsed. <laughs> you look you look suspect. You're like, I don't know about this, James. No, okay. Well, so but 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 so let me just clarify. Like, does this seem reasonable? Yeah. The particle is moving along this curve. It started maybe here. If you like, at time equals zero, 
It ends over here at some other time equals later. And this length from here to here is the distance it traveled. And however long it took, if we divide that distance by how long it took, that'd be the average velocity. But we are interested, as we often are, in the instantaneous velocity. So we want to know the rate of change at a particular moment. So let's look at, say, this moment right here. I'm going to draw a little tangent curve. And the idea is, oh, that tangent curve I could think of as having an X component and a Y component. So this small change in the length of the curve, we can think of as the hypotenuse of a right triangle where the horizontal, right? Here's a small change in the horizontal component. And here's a small change in the vertical component. Or if you prefer, you can think of this as this is a small change in the particle's velocity in the x direction, velocity in the y direction, velocity in the third direction. It should, yeah. Okay. So, Pythagorean theorem time. It looks like dx dt squared plus dy dt squared equals ds dt squared. Seems reasonable. We're all good with the Pythagorean theorem. For solving this, it looks like we've got ds dt equal to the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared. Multiplying both sides by dt, we've got ds equal to the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt. So, if I instead make the more normal choice and say that this is t equal to some beginning position A, this is equal to t into some ending position B, then this total length is going to be the integral of ds, right? ds is just a small change in the length. So, we're adding up all the ds's. So, the total length, which I personally prefer to write as L for some reason, I'll try and go with more convention. The total length S is going to be the integral from A to B of DS. That's how I really honestly always think of it. Now I'm going to change that to be this in a second because that's what we use. But I really want to specify here when I'm thinking about adding up all of the length of a curve, I'm just saying, oh, I'm adding up all the small bits of S. Just like if I wanted to find the total length x, I could add up all the, the integral of dx from x equals something to x equals something. So here I'm adding up all the ds's, but ds we have a particular formula for. That's going to be, I'm right, this is s equal to the integral from t equals a to t equals b of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. Well, and this is, I should point out, this is one of three versions of DS. This is the parametric version of DS. We're going to talk about the more, you might not have actually talked about this version in class yet, because people often save this until they get to the end of 21B, when they talk about polar and parametric equations, and they're like, oh, I remember arc length, here's another formula for arc length. But we're going to show it to you now, because it's good to see now. So here's an arc length formula. Let's talk about finding the length of a curve. Using it. So let's find, yeah. Let's find the length. What time have I got? Okay. I really like to give you guys a surface area example too. We'll see if we could find the length of the curve defined by parametrically by x equal to cosine of t, y equal to t plus sine of t. Zero goes from t goes from zero to pi. Kind of funky. So here's what you've kind of got. 
All right, one second here. I mean, we don't really have to graph this. We could though, right? If we think about plotting some points, if T is zero, cosine of zero is one, sine of zero is zero plus zero. If T is pi over two, cosine of pi over two is zero, sine of pi over two is one plus pi over two. And if T is pi, cosine of pi is negative one, sine of pi is zero. So it's kind of a funky, right? Like if I was to try and graph this thing, well, maybe my graph could be a little bit better fine. So I get the point one zero, and then I get the point zero comma one plus pi over two, which is like two and a half ish. Maybe like there. And then I get the point negative one comma pi, which is like, it's like it's doing something like this. And I guess that's all I really care about. It might move in a different way after that, but that's what I want. He is moving in the positive direction. The graph is going to be True. So, well, so let's see what happens when we do the interval, and then we'll talk about it. So we're going to do the usual thing. The S is equal to the integral from T equals zero to T equals pi of the square root of dx dt which is going to be negative sine of t squared, which is dx dt, plus dy dt squared, which is going to be 1 plus cosine of t quantity squared. And it's kind of small. Apologies. One, is it 1 plus the... So I'm just differentiating, right? Here's my y. Derivative of t is one, derivative of sine is positive cosine. Oh. Um, t. Okay. Um, I will say there's kind of a thing about worrying more about the order of this later on when we talk about going from left to right or right to left. At this stage, we kind of just usually t should be going from the lower value to the upper value. That's not maybe always 100% true. But we'll talk more. We can talk more about that a little later. Um, simplifying this actually is a little bit hairy. So we've got the square root of sine squared plus one plus cosine quantity squared is going to be one plus two cosine t plus cosine squared t dt. Interesting. So what do I notice? I notice I've got a sine squared plus a cosine squared, which is equal to, right. So this becomes the integral from zero to pi of the square root of two plus two cosine of t. There's a lot of ways people do this particular problem. If you look at Grant's notes, he does it by doing some manipulation and then getting to a u substitution eventually. I tend to prefer to see this one as a funky trig identity. So here's what I'm going to show you. This is cut. So I'm here's what I'm really thinking of. Here's what's getting me there. I am thinking of the fact that cosine of two theta is equal to one plus cosine. Sorry, cos no, that's no, co sorry. Well, God, ah, cosine of theta. Sorry. I missed where the two theta went. Is equal to one plus cosine of two theta all over two. Now I know that doesn't exactly look like this, but it's close enough. I can multiply both sides by four and say four cosine of theta is equal to two plus two cosine of two theta. And then I can replace two theta with t. So I can say four cosine of T over two is equal to two plus two cosine of two times T over two. And that is exactly that. Oh, and, oh my God. I should just end class now. Right, it's not terrible. I just, uh, so, so you guys might know I've made a mistake. I have made a mistake. It's not a huge one. I'm going to fix it really easily, 
but I definitely made a mistake. And the mistake was, it's not cosine theta equal one plus cosine two theta over two. It's cosine squared theta, which is much better for trying to take the square root of this thing. So here's what we've actually got. We have the integral from zero to pi of the square root of four cosine squared of t over two dt. What's the square root of four? What's the square root of cosine squared? Right. So we can write this as the integral from zero to pi of two cosine of t over two. Which then we can anti-differentiate and get two times sine of t over two divided by one half or multiplied by two from zero to pi. And that's gonna be four times sine of pi over two minus four times sine of zero, which just ends up being four times one. Did you move it to out in front? Totally, yeah, yeah definitely, 100%, yeah. Good Welcome. So this is, a, this is kind of a funky problem, right? Like it's not super easy to, to know to do, to see this and go to there. But it is something people do, so I wanted you to see it. Um, but let's get more to the point, not more to the point, but um, so here's what we're going to do with this. And we're going to actually get the real or the normal arc length formula, which is if we take our arc length formula, which was s equal to the integral from t equals a to t equals b of the square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt. If we let y be some function of x, what we can do is we can essentially say, well, if we let x equal t, and y equal that same function of t, then we're getting the same relationship. But if we do this, let's see what this becomes. So our arc length integral is going to become, well, dx dt, if x is equal to t, what's the derivative of t with respect to t? One. One. And if y is equal to this function of t, dy dt is just dy dt. You can also say it's f prime of t if you really wanted to. But I'm just going to put it as dy dt squared. And then the dt is still the dt. But dy dt is the same as dy dx. So this is right, because if you're saying y equals f of x or y equals f of t, it's the same function, just a different variable. So dy dt and dy dx are essentially the same. So we can rewrite this arc length integral as the integral of the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx. And that's kind of the more normal way of writing it. Yeah, we got time. So for example, if we wanted to say, find the arc length of y equal to, what have we got here? X to the three halves from the point zero, zero to the point four comma eight, we can use this formula. So we're going to say, and we can also draw the picture if you want, like y equals x to the three halves. How does that look? Two thirds? Sorry, one thing. Three halves looks kind of like that. Okay. Three halves looks kind of funky. I like that. I'm trying to find the length of this curve. And so I'm going to do the integral of ds. I really, really can't stress enough that 
this square root of whatever times d whatever, that is ds. It's a small change in the arc length of, just like, sorry, just like, just like square root of dx dt squared plus dy dt squared dt, that is also ds. There's a lot of different ds's. There's actually three of them. But here, we're just integrating ds. And in this particular case, it's going to be the integral from x equals 0 to x equals 4 of the square root of 1 plus whatever dy dx is, quantity squared, yeah. In this case, we get the integral from zero to four of the square root of one plus, let's see, dy dx is three halves x to the one half, and then we're gonna square that. And then we're gonna get the integral from zero to four of the square root of one plus nine fourths x dx. This one, you could do a little u substitution or you can kind of even not, right? If we kind of just think about it, we would let u equal one plus nine fourths x or du would equal nine fourths dx. So four ninths times du would equal dx. I guess we could do it. So this is gonna be four ninths du. And then this is gonna be the square root of u or u to the one half. Should I change the limits of integration? Yeah. So if x equals zero, what's u gonna be? And if x equals four, what's u gonna be? Right. Then we integrate, we get four ninths times u to the three halves divided by three halves or times two thirds from one to 10, and then we just plug in. We don't have to change back. So we end up getting um, four ninths times two thirds is eight twenty sevenths times 10 to the three halves minus one to the three halves. And one to any power is just one. So I'd probably write this as eight twenty sevenths times 10 to the three halves minus one. Um, Hmm, interesting. I didn't know that. So yeah, I really like to I'd really love to throw one more example at you all just because there's a very kind of standard type of function that we ask to find the arc length of. Or I should say there's a type of function that has the same sort of pattern all the time. So let's look at one more example real quick. We'll try to do it fast. So let's say we want to find the arc length of y equal to x to the fourth over eight plus, oh, sorry, x to the fourth over four. Sorry, come on, paper. Okay, so let's say we have this example. y equals this function on the interval from where x is between one and two. Okay, let me get straight to the point here because we only have less than two minutes here. The whole point of a, a function specifically like this, watch what happens. I'm gonna take the derivative. The derivative is gonna be four x cubed over four. Um, this is a one eighth times x to the negative second. So its derivative is one eighth times negative two x to the negative third, which I'm gonna simplify and get x cubed um, minus one over four x cubed. And here's the thing I really want you all to see. When you square this, and why am I squaring it? Because I know I'm gonna use the arc length formula where I get one plus dy dx squared. Look what happens specifically. When we square this out, we get this times itself. I mean, I'm getting x cubed times x cubed, so x to the sixth, minus one fourth x cubed times x, sorry, minus one over four x cubed times x cubed is minus one fourth. 
And then another minus one fourth, minus one fourth, minus one fourth is minus two fourths, which is minus one half. That minus one half is super important. And then minus one over four x cubed is minus one over four x cubed is plus one over 16 x to the six. Okay, check this out. Here's the whole thing. When you add one to this, what changes? One plus dy dx squared is this same thing, except instead of negative one half, what do I have? Right, and it's super necessary that that not only changes values, but changes to exactly the opposite sign. Hey, look at this. This thing now factors super nicely. So I want to say this again. When you have something like this, it is almost for sure going to be the case that when you take the derivative and square it, the middle term is going to be negative one half. And then when you add one to it, the middle term changes sign to positive one half. And then we can refactor this as almost the same thing as before, except with the middle sign changed. So now this is going to factor as x to the third plus one over four x cubed times x to the third plus one over four x cubed. Literally almost the same thing, except for the middle sign has changed. Or in other words, x to the third plus one over four x cubed squared. But hey, look, now let's actually write down the arc length formula. The arc length is going to be the integral from one to two of the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx. And so if you start with something that's like this, you can almost bet your whatever, your last dollar, bet your bottom dollar. That's an old person thing to say. You can bet your bottom dollar. That's like a song from Aunt Orphan Andy or something, right? Yeah. Bet, yeah. There'll be sunshine. Yeah, something like that. Tomorrow there'll be sun. That's actually the lyrics. Okay. So anyway, if you see something like this, you can be very, very likely assured that when you take the derivative and square it, the middle term is going to be negative one half. You're going to add back the one to get a positive one half. And then it's going to factor just like it was before, except this middle sign, whatever it was, it might have been positive. We'll have, well, no, it should have been negative, sorry. We'll have changed to this here. What do you mean by when you see it like that? When you see something like, like, it takes practice. But like, when you see something like this, I can see that when I take the derivative of x to the fourth, I'm going to get an x cubed. When I take the derivative of x to the negative second, I'm going to get an x to the negative third. And when you multiply those together, the middle term is going to have a zero power, meaning it's just going to be a constant. So when the two powers? Well, after you differentiate when the two powers cancel. So then this is going to end up being the integral from one to two of the square root of x cubed plus one over four. I'm going to write this as x to the negative third, just to write it in a way that's easier to answer differentiate. And then the square root of something squared, they just cancel out. So you end up with the integral from one to two of x cubed plus one fourth x to the negative third dx. And then we anti differentiate and we get x to the fourth over four plus one fourth x to the negative two over negative two from one to two. Or in other words, you get almost exactly the same function you started out with. except the sign in the middle has changed. Now that said, you still have to show this work to get there. You can't just be like, oh, I know what that is. I know that the answer is gonna be that same function. This is the opposite sign. And so then you plug in two and you get a 16 over four minus, I should really write this as X to the fourth over four minus one over eight X squared from one to two. And then you plug in two and you get 16 over four minus one over eight times four. And then you plug in one and you get one fourth minus one eighth, whatever that is. But this kind of thing happens a lot. There's a lot of problems in this section of the textbook where you have like y equal to something plus something or x equal to something plus something. And it's this kind of pattern every time. Right, it happens a lot. It's kind of the most common example because they are some ones that are actually easy to evaluate. A lot of these arc length problems, they end up being integrals that are nearly impossible or actually impossible. Um, so I should stop talking, but I just want to say one more thing, which is that you also see this kind of thing come up in the, um, the surface area problems. 
where you still have this kind of function. It's just there's going to be an added piece to it. So we'll talk about surface area on Monday. Sorry we didn't get to today. For those of you that have tests, good luck as they go out.